You're in the water loop. <laughs> Thanks for coming in the water loop. This is Travis. Really excited to be with Marcus Erickson today, co-founder of, of Five Gyres. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for, for having me on the podcast. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you. I do just have to kind of read a little bit about your bio so uh, folks know about you. So you've, you've led expeditions around the world to research plastic marine pollution, uh, co-publishing the first global estimate and discovery of plastic microbeads in the Great Lakes that helped lead to a, a federal, uh, federal uh, action on that. Uh, you and Ann Cummings began Five Gyres with an 88-day journey from California to Hawaii on the junk raft built from 15,000 plastic bottles bottles. So we'll have to talk about that. Uh, you also rafted down the Mississippi River. Um, you were a, a veteran. You were a Marine in the, in the Gulf War and wrote a book about that uh, and also uh, wrote a book about the junk raft experience. So uh, really excited to talk to you and uh, hear all about this. So from an a oceanography standpoint, what are the five gyres? So the five gyres, they are uh, these natural uh, current systems. In the Northern Hemisphere, there are three. The, uh, the North Atlantic, North Pacific. Um, I, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry there are two. In the Southern Hemisphere, there are three. The Indian Ocean, the South Atlantic, South Pacific. These five subtropical gyres, they're dominated by these wind-driven currents that accumulate you know, floating debris into the centers, where there is, there's a stable high-pressure system and floating trash kind of migrates there because the wind and waves, they kind of slow down. So like in the Northern Hemisphere, they're, they're clockwise. So the Southern Hemisphere, they're counterclockwise. So these five subtropical gyres are where much of the trash leaving land, the little bit that escapes in the ocean gets stuck there temporarily. Okay. It, it, it gets really complicated pretty quick <laughs> to think about, you know, all the trash in the ocean and where it goes. Um, I just have to throw out there that, you know, when we're out in the, in the middle of the ocean surveying plastics, what's out in the middle is almost almost exclusively uh, fishing gear. Things are lost at sea during those maritime activities. A lot of fishing crates, five-gallon buckets, um, oil cans from, from you know, uh, uh, adding oil to your diesel engines. Um, a lot of fishing nets, big, giant tangle balls of netting, fishing buoys which can be up to a couple centimeters thick, this thick-walled round buoy. They survive in the oceans uh, for a very long time. Um, what's so, so a lot of people, a lot of people, when they hear about the, you know, the, the garbage, the plastic in the ocean, they think that it's, you know, mostly water bottles and stuff like that floating around. It's pretty interesting to hear a bit about this, this heavy presence of fishing gear and, and so forth. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's just not the, the consumer plastics out there. Um, yeah. If you, if you talk to some, some of the, the, the newest sort of modeling of, of ocean currents and distribution of trash, what we're finding is that the trash that leaves our coastlines, maybe between you know, 3 to 5% is, is able to survive and make it past the coast into the middle of the ocean. Most of it is washing back on shore. So most scientists agree now, you know, if you want to really pull trash out of the oceans, keep our oceans clean of trash, clean of trash. Coastal recovery is a big part of it. Mm. Beach cleanups, they're, they're cheap to do, they've been time tested, they engage people, and they keep the trash from washing back in the ocean. Important to do coastal recovery. But what's out at sea, there's a real need, and I would say there is this, this gap in, in, in the work being done on engaging fishing industries to take more responsibility for the life, the life cycle of their gear. Now, there are a lot of, a lot of folks that are beginning to work on this, but that's what pollutes the most of the, of the deep ocean trash we find in the gyres. Interesting. All right, so this may sound like a, uh, a, a bit of an overly simplistic question or naive question or something, but could you explain <laughs> why this plastic is, is bad? What's what's really the problem with it? Obviously, we've got a lot of these uh, news stories where it's you know getting entangled in marine life and choking them. And I, we just had a, a endangered whale wash up on the beach here in Wilmington, North Carolina, that had 
that died because of plastic in its esophagus. Um, but yeah, why is why is this plastic bad? Why is this trash in the ocean so bad? Seems like a simple simple question, but I'd love to hear your answer. Well, you know, you, you just named one of the biggest impacts through you know, ingestion uh, and the second entanglement. So if you look at ecological impacts. We're seeing now, you know, I'd say 20 years ago, there was a trickle of literature saying, okay, here's a fish observed eating trash or a whale entangled or a sea turtle eating a plastic bag. Mm-hmm. Now, when you talk to, when I talk to my colleagues that study sea turtles, every sea turtle that they do a necropsy on, you know, look inside the stomach, there's always plastic. Mm-hmm. Most marine mammals are eating trash. So it's, it's pretty ubiquitous, uh, the impact of trash through ingestion. Entanglement uh, we see a lot of animals getting entangled in, mostly fishing nets, fishing line. You know, sometimes you'll have hoops from the lids of bottles or the lids of buckets. They get around the heads of some uh, marine mammals, marine reptiles. Those are, those are some of the ecological impacts. And it's not just on in the ocean. I'm in the middle right now of a study working with uh, uh, Dr. Uli Werner from Dubai. Look at the ingestion of plastic bags by camels. I mean, just two days ago, I took a, a 50-pound mass of plastic bags that we found in Dubai inside the rib cage of a desiccated camel in the desert. And we were submerging it in water, getting displacement measures, weighing it, doing this analysis. So the ecological impacts of plastic waste are really global. Mm. So that's, but there's also an economic side to this. Urban blight. Um, there is, there's a lot of evidence from economists saying when you have a trashed landscape, it decreases property values. That was just that's, that was a story that just came out in Baltimore where the trash wheel, it's a device that's pulling trash out of rivers. They found property values increased because of a cleaner waterways and a cleaner bay. Um, there's also navigational hazards. I can't tell you how many uh, reports from other ships and actually my own experience getting your, your prop tangled by a net in the middle of the ocean. So those navigational hazards are there. But, you know, I I should add, and I want to make sure that this point gets driven home, that a lot of these impacts, the the ecological, the economic impacts, can be reduced very quickly if we can get a handle on stopping the flow of trash from our cities out to the environment, to land and sea. It's, It's pretty amazing looking at the modeling of ocean trash at the ocean is really dynamic. It kicks out trash pretty fast. So if we can get handle on maritime activities, losing nets and buoys and, and rope and line, if we get a handle on cities losing single-use packaging and bottles and bags and cup lids and straws, the ocean kicks it out. It kicks it out, it fragments it, it sinks it, it gets rid of it. And, and, and I'll offer you uh, some, some evidence of this. Um, one colleague of mine, Nikolai Maximenko, He's been the lead on studying tsunami debris from the Japan tsunami in 2011. What he found was, he just published this a few months ago, that seven years after the tsunami, of the estimated 1,000 fishing boats lost to sea, and these are small skiffs, blue and white skiffs you may have seen on TV. Right. Um, they made the news quite a bit. Of the 1,000 skiffs, 90% have come ashore in seven years. 90%. Wow. The ocean doesn't want this trash. It's just a constant input of, of this garbage. So we're focused, and, and we're seeing the global movement is focused on prevention because we get that prevention is key. And, and, you know, if you think of other environmental issues like the hole in the ozone layer, once the media made a big sensationalized story and there was public outrage, there was 10 years of good science. And, and the focus became prevention. We banned CFCs and the hole has closed. Same for smog over cities. When that was a big issue, 1970s and 80s, we saw after 10 years of science, regulation on car emissions. And smog, I live here in Los Angeles, the smog cleared up. And the last thing, which is really important to this conversation, uh, tar balls on, on beaches which is a big issue back in the 70s and 80s. When I was a kid in Louisiana, we used to go to Mississippi to the beach, and we'd bring a little bottle of acetone, fingernail polish remover, to take the tar off our feet. Wow. As soon as maritime law 
made it illegal for big oil tankers to rinse sludge out of their hulls into the ocean, which was common practice. A big oil tanker would drop off oil and then rinse out the sludge in the bottom. That was what was making tar, balls of tar washing ashore. Once it became illegal, a huge drop in tar in the ocean. So what that points to is prevention is key, and the ocean kicks out the tar balls. The ocean it kicks it out. And yeah, I think uh, in all these examples you're talking about, you know, when we give nature a break, right, like it has some pretty powerful abilities to, to heal itself or to kind of restore itself. We just have to we got to back off as humans and stop doing what we're doing to it. That's amazing. When did when did you uh, when did this all start happening for you? When did you uh, discover this uh, problem in the ocean? You know, it. To, to be honest, I have to go back in time about 25 years. Okay. It would, it would likely go to when I was in the first Gulf War in Kuwait. If you remember, uh, I'm sure lots of your audience remember seeing the oil fields on fire in Kuwait in 1991. Mm-hmm. So I was with the Marines on the ground in, in that war. Um, I was a grunt carrying an M16 running around digging foxholes. And I remember being covered with petroleum, covered with little drops of oil and soot. And, and taking a really hard philosophical look, why do we fight? What are we fighting for? And I really got to understand, you know, foreign policy and our international dependence on fossil fuels and everything from fossil fuels, from the chemistry to the energy, from, from fuels and lubricants for cars to plastics. And, you know, it's taken me, it took me a good decade, decade and a half really understand you know where i can where i can be the change i want to be in the world Mm. and my first foray into that was to to build a raft and float the mississippi river which was actually an idea i had sitting in a foxhole in kuwait (laughs) to a marine next to me saying if we survive this let's build a raft like tom and huck and (laughs) it finds off of the war we said we're gonna, gonna do it now i couldn't find him a decade later 13 years later, actually, but, but I made my raft and I spent 13 years on the Mississippi River. And I can tell you it was cathartic for so many reasons. First, I got connected deeply to nature, which I kind of had lost. Mm. Now, when I go back home to, to Louisiana, to New Orleans, I'll often go to the river and just put my hand on the water. Mm. And it's, it's like saying hello to, to family. Mm. And I, I learned being so close to nature. I spent five months on the Mississippi River camping every night watching the stars. I saw Aurora Borealis in, uh, in Tennessee. Wow. It, it was an amazing experience, just deeply connected to nature. And it makes you want to defend nature much more. At the same time, I met so many people that were really concerned about our environment and about each other. The basic goodness of people really came forward in a big way. So when I came back from the Mississippi River, I felt really empowered to engage in the plastics issue. I saw so much trash going down the Mississippi River. And I thought, this is wrong. This is worth fighting for. Our addiction to fossil fuels and addiction to plastics and the harm it causes, you know, what can what can I do to, to solve the problem? I met my wife, Anna Cummins, the perfect match. And we began five gyres together. We saw this big question in the world 10 years ago, which was, how much trash is in the oceans? Where is it? What kind of material is it? And what's the impact? And our organization is Five Gyres. We've sailed 20 expeditions around the world. Uh, we publish some, some I'm, I'm proud to say, collaboratively, some important papers. And we're still at it. The movement has formed. And everyone's working upstream on prevention. It's a great place to be now. I'm much more optimistic now than I was 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I definitely have heard known of your organization for a while. You guys are are, are really well known, and that's that's awesome. So, one of your uh, one of your great journeys out there was building this this raft, the the junk raft, um, taking plastic bottles and <laughs> sailing from Los Angeles to Hawaii, uh, which is just a vast expanse of ocean, and uh, it's incredible that you would take that journey on. Uh, uh, something you know of that material and made that way. So um, tell me, like, uh, how how this thing was constructed? How was how was this built? What was it made of? It was it was made of 
junk, and that was our, our point. So I live, in, I live in Los Angeles. We built it here in Los Angeles. We took uh, 15,000 plastic bottles. A bunch of schools helped us collect them, mostly two-liter bottles. Mm. And Patagonia had discontinued using Nalgene bottles with uh, bisphenol A in them. They, they said, take these, use them for your raft. So we did. Um, for a cabin, we chose a Cessna 310 aircraft fuselage. I found in the most amazing junkyard in Southern California, half buried in the desert, this airplane. And then we, uh, we took out 24 sailboat masts. My, my co-navigator, his name is Joel Pascal, an amazing sailor, very talented sailor. He worked for NOAA for a bit, put, pulling fishing nets off of uh, Northwest Hawaiian Islands. A good sailor, a good uh, a marine biologist. So he and I were the co-navigators. And Anna, my wife, she was mission control on land, watching weather. We were a great team. So we launched from, uh, from Los Angeles. And we thought it might take four weeks, maybe. It takes an average sailboat three weeks. We thought four, maybe six weeks, just you know, drifting, riding the currents, sailing, you know, twenty-four and seven. Uh, six weeks into the trip, we weren't even halfway across. Oh wow! <laughs> and we had no motor. We had no support vessel. It was just me and Joel, and then Anna saying. You got to you got to stay north, stay in the cold water, avoid the warm water where hurricanes form Four, you know, hurricanes came right under us. They gave us wind because they go counterclockwise and wind pushed us toward Hawaii. We got to Waikiki 13 weeks later, uh, lost a bit of weight. Um, It was quite an amazing adventure. And that raft, it, it survived the journey. Barely. It was constantly, you know, falling apart like all boats do. Um, the sea is pretty rough on anything moving. And uh, the raft now is on display in Long Beach at a great new institution called Alta Sea. You can see the raft. Unfortunately, it smells like cats because they live in a trailer while I have storage for 10 years. Turning <laughs> <laughs> out in this, in this Alta Sea amazing space in Long Beach. Um, but that raft journey had kind of launched, that was our first expedition. It kind of okay. launched us as an organization we have been able to build the awareness, but you know, awareness, awareness isn't enough in the world today. Awareness only gets you, gets you an audience. It's where you go from there mm. and the solutions that you're offering to the world. You know, even the plastics industry offers awareness and they say, but the solution is recycling only or chemical recycling. And we, we take the awareness and say, it's on prevention, smarter products, smarter systems for delivering goods to people without legacy of trash, uh, smarter waste management systems. Um, so, so, so we took that awareness of the raft and we, um, we then launched organization, launched expeditions, did some science and did science that supported some bigger campaigns like the microbead bill that we passed that Obama signed in 2015. Yeah, incredible. So there's a lot of, uh, I'm trying to get a handle or get your estimate on how much plastic is in the ocean. I mean, that's an ever-changing number. There's different studies. There's different research. Um, you hear kind of, I think, the thing about there's going to plastics, pieces of plastic will outnumber fish in the ocean by, what, 2050 or something like that. What's uh, what's just the latest and probably most accurate uh, information on, on how much plastic is out there? So it, it really is a moving target as things as things change. Uh, we did an estimate three years ago. We we took every every known bit of data on trash in the oceans, and we use our, our 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 current modeling to then extrapolate what there might be in areas where we haven't got data. And we came up with a number: uh, 5.25 trillion particles from a quarter million tons. Mm. And, and and that study was was redone uh, about a year later. And it's not far off the mark. So we're looking at, you know, a quarter to half a million tons of trash floating in the ocean surface. Uh, But what's interesting, that amount, it sounds like a lot, a quarter million tons. That's less than 1% of one year's production of new plastic. Mm. So now we're making more than 350 million tons of plastic every year. Mm. And it's going to it's going to be more and more in the future. And then that increased production, it's due to a growing population of people on the planet and a rising middle class worldwide. 
Everyone now is getting a cell phone. Many more people are getting refrigerators and cars and construction. A lot of plastics are used there. A lot of technology uses plastics. So there is that increase. But unfortunately, part of that is an increase in packaging, single-use throwaway packaging. And that's between that and fishing gear are the two biggest culprits for ocean trash. Um, so, yeah, that's, so if you're looking at the amount of trash in the oceans, what I often tell people is uh, if we can stop the flow of trash from land to sea, all that, that half a million tons is going to be pushed out pretty quickly. It's going to be yeah. pushed ashore. It's going to be fragmented and sunk. I think I should offer the public well, one quick thing. Uh, so I should offer the public a way to visualize trash in the oceans. Okay. So 5.25 trillion particles of plastics. About 93 percent is all particles less than the size of a grain of rice. Wow. So I offer people to imagine imagine smog, a smog of plastic. Now, when you think of smog, you think of our particulate over our skies of the small particles, trillions of them. Yeah each one being a, a pollutant mm-hmm. for plastics in the oceans. It's, it's mostly the small stuff. The big stuff is fishing gear, almost exclusively. The small stuff is all microplastics, and we now found it. I was trawling in the Arctic at 72 degrees north, finding microplastics. I was near the equator two years ago, finding microplastics. Every lake we survey, from Mongolia to the Great Lakes, we find microplastics. So... That's the distribution. It's fragmenting. It goes, here's, here's a way to visualize it. It flows to the middle of the ocean. It fragments by UV degradation or animals tearing it apart. It'll either get pushed onto a shoreline or it's going to sink where it's going to go to the ocean floor or to deeper currents and get pushed globally. Mm-hmm. So that's microplastics globally. We're finding them in sediments worldwide. Um, and we're finding lots of the big stuff washing ashore. You just want to turn off the tap. Yeah, that's the first. That's one of the first steps for sure. So, a uh, couple questions on the tap and on the microplastics, both ends here. Um, I saw some stuff recently. You know, I know the fishing gear is a big part of it, but about plastic coming where it comes into the ocean from, and Asia being like the biggest source of plastic entering the ocean. Is that consistent with what you know? And yes. Yes, okay. it is. So, so yeah, and, and that makes sense because in the globalized market, the last 20 years, you know, Southeast Asia didn't have plastics 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. Well, still use throwaway plastics. But in a globalized market, the distribution of goods has, has traveled to much of Southeast Asia and heavily packaged. And, and without, any, without any producer responsibility on how The package, how they're made, the quality materials, and the recyclability, the legacy of, of that lack of regulation is mountains of trash across Southeast Asia. And that's where in the last, I'd say, 10 years, we have seen a lot of waste management issues. Mm. A lot of- every remote place I visit, every island I visit, the, the only real economic option is to burn it. Mm. So across Southeast Asia, anyone that travels in Southeast Asia, the smell of burning plastic is pretty common. Every island I go to, even a little island called Pond Inlet at 72 degrees north, way in the Canadian Arctic, I was there trawling for microplastics, and I look, and their landfill is on fire. Population 1,200 burning their landfill. Because the economics to reverse logistics of, of those plastic materials back to the producer, it doesn't exist. So that's... That's the shift I see. Uh, we're shifting from this linear economy where things get moved in one direction. When they get consumed, that's where the waste accumulates. There's a shift in the world. It's a, it's a challenge to make it happen to create a circular economy where the packaging, either it's, it's, it's biodegradable and it's okay to stay where it goes. It becomes a nutrient for the soil or systems exist to get it back to the producer. That's the world we want. Yeah, I just saw I just saw a story. I mean, it's a simple thing, but a uh, you know the six pack ring that you'd find on a six pack of beer. Uh, they, they, this brewery is using one that's made of a biodegradable material, and it's made of like wheat and barley. So if it does find its way into the ocean, it'll disappear. Or it's okay if turtles eat that, <laughs> I guess. Um, that's smart. That's that's what we're seeing. You're seeing a lot of companies with the early adopters are saying, okay, our company philosophy 
It's not about leaving a legacy of trash. So like this company you mentioned, and, I, and I've heard of a few that do that, make six-pack rings out of a real dense, a dense um, uh, uh, pulp right. or yeah. cardboard. That's, that's smart. Why not do that? And there are more companies that are doing things like that. Paper straws, using paper bags are reusable. A lot of reusable containers being used. And we're seeing some cities are creating a, a network of reusable materials. Like I've seen some cities where many coffee shops are saying, okay, we're going to honor the same cup, the same mm-hmm. coffee mug. Bring it to any coffee shop. We'll wash it. we refill it. And no need for throwaways or takeaways anymore. Yeah, that's encouraging stuff to see. Back on the other end of the spectrum, the microplastics end, not the not the source, but kind of this, um, the smog and sinking to the sea floor and uh, getting into fish and and you know the fish that we consume. Um, I don't want to be all doom and gloom and negative with stuff because there, there's uh, positive things that need to happen. But what's your what's your take on that? I mean, to me, that's a real human health concern that uh, you know. Microplastics are just permeating the the food chain there, and people continue to eat fish and and so forth. So, what are your what are your thoughts? Well, you know, the evidence for microplastic impacts, demonstrated harm on humans, isn't isn't quite there yet. It's very mm-hmm. difficult to to put a human in a test tube and see, you know, <clears throat> what happens when they eat a bunch of microplastics. There is some evidence that humans that consume fish, or especially shellfish, which are filter feeders. Are consuming thousands of micro microplastic particles, you know, on an annual basis. One study found like eleven thousand microfibers you consume if you're eating, you know, oysters or clams regularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but does that cause cause harm? Demonstrated mm-hmm. harm. Evidence isn't clear yet. Um, there is evidence it affects individual organisms, and there's growing evidence it can affect populations. Uh, filter feeding, for example, there was one study of oysters that showed that filter feeding oysters, uh, with the abundance of microplastics, there's reduced feeding behavior um, and reduce, reduced uh, fertility. And those studies are rare. That's what the front line is on ecological impacts, is are there population level impacts at ecologically relevant concentrations? So although there's a smog of plastics everywhere, are they harming populations of organisms? And that's a frontier of science. And we're finding in some cases, yes, but there's not a whole lot yet. With, with, with humans, our impact on our bodies, a lot comes from pre-consumer plastics. So it's important to note that, you know, it's about exposure. We're exposed more to new plastics than to plastic trash. Um, so new plastics, um, it's in the chemistry of new plastics are in the bottles, the straws, the single-use packaging that we touch all the time, or things packaged in plastics where the chemistry might leach into those products. Um, we like have B- like BPA was the big, you know, the big famous one, and everybody wants a BPA-free bottle and so forth. But there's other there's other chemicals that are in plastics that are of concern. But you know, BPA is still around us. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's out of it's out of bottles, but adding machine tape, for example. If you take a receipt from any shop, uh, get it wet, hold in your hand for a little bit, open your hand, if you see a white residue, that's pure BPA. And the metal cans on rust on the inside is a thin layer of plastic. It's full of BPA. Uh, the, the, the lining of, uh, of soda cans. Why is, is, is it the, um, the acidity of a can not rotting the inside out? It's a thin layer of plastics. Take a little can, does all the aluminum away, a little tiny thin plastic bag. Mm-hmm. So our, our exposure is constant to pre-consumer plastics. So it's important on that front to sort of, for us as a, a movement that's working on, on impacts of chemistry, is to look at the chemistry that's in the products that we have constant exposure to. But as waste, there is some exposure um, if you're eating some of the organisms that are eating trash, like shellfish, for example. So there are there are concerns there are concerns for human health, and I always come back to you know microplastics form as a result of macroplastics breaking down. It can be from the fleece of your garment, you know you wash it. I mean dryer lint really. If you take one big wad of dryer lint, you've got thousands of microfibers in your hands, mm-hmm. uh, and we find that wastewater effluent from big cities are pumping billions of microfibers into our waterways. 
And those can absorb other chemicals. They can absorb PCBs. They can absorb pesticides. They can absorb flame retardants. And then release them in the guts of organisms that ingest them. That we end up eating those organisms. So there still are some unknowns. But again, I say, if we can get a handle on, on reducing the loss of, of macro litter, single-use plastics from our coastlines, and engage fishing industries to take better responsibility for their gear, you will see a sharp reduction in a decade or less of trash in our environment and, and thus trash in our bodies. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people think that, well, I recycle every single bit of every single bottle or whatever it might be. I get it in my recycling. I'm a, I recycle 100 percent of the plastic that comes through my life. Um, and I, again, just have seen some you know, recent stories about the percentage of, of that plastic that actually gets recycled, something like 9% or 9 or 10%. Um, 9 percent yeah. was the EPA's uh, uh, estimate. I was at about five-year-old report. Okay. It, it's, it's a dismal failure. I, and I hate to say, I'm not trying to be. No, negative. we're going to, we're going to come back around and we're going to end on some positive stuff. This is our, this will be our last kind of negative. <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, I think it's, I guess it's less negative, more just a big reality check. You know, we've been told, and a lot of this has been the industries that make plastic saying, oh, just recycle it. Don't regulate design or the amount that we're making. Just focus on recycling. And you, the taxpayer, your city, you and your city, you guys pay for it. That's been the strategy. And that's what has happened. And now, right now, um, you're seeing cities do not know what to do with all the, res- all the plastics they're collecting. And that's partly due to this a whole other subject. China has stopped taking our trash. For the longest time, they were taking roughly half of America's plastics was getting shipped in, in empty shipping containers back to China. And they just uh, about a year ago said no more. It was called the, uh, um, the, um, uh, the National Sword. They said no more trash. So now U.S. is sort of fumbling saying, what do we do with all this stuff? Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, I was in Cleveland and they told the city – don't put anything except for jugs and bottles in your recycle bin. We won't take anything else. No plastic bags, no straws, no cups, no, uh, no plastic, anything. So that means that's going to the landfill then. Landfill. Mm-hmm. Landfill or incinerator. And that is not – what we want is a circular economy. The, the linear system where you make it, transport it, and wash your hands responsibility is trashing the planet quickly. Yeah, Humans yeah. can't deal with mountains of trash. So creating circularity. We get really good at at reusing materials, reducing the need for for, for excess packaging, um, refurbishing, which means repairing goods, uh, buying quality materials uh, in, in what we call an heirloom culture, where you buy some quality and you pass it on to your your kids. You know, you just invest in good stuff. Yeah. Those kinds of uh, uh, ways of of being in the world, they're not an inconvenience. It's not a throwback to to to, to to, to the past, it's a modern way of, of envisioning 10 billion people on the planet. You can't make throwaway stuff. You get that many people. We're not adding more land and sea to the planet. We're just adding more people and more consumerism. We've got to get smart. And that's where yeah. a circular economy can get us there. Well, I hope you can build on that because I, I, I guess I wanted to really ask about um, things that people can do, individuals can do. You guys have a great list on your website. I encourage people to go to go check it out, look at your website, uh, get educated, and look at this list of things that people can do uh, in their lives, in their homes, in their communities to make a difference. So I was hoping you could just kind of build on that because these are positive things. These are This sure. is the information we want out there. I think the first thing I tell people, uh, the individual – if we're going to focus on the individual, because a lot has to do with industry, EPR, extended producer responsibility, and that's a legislative fight, or getting our cities worldwide to get better waste management. Um, what you can do as an individual is to zero waste your, your life. That means to uh, produce less, less plastics. Uh, hang on one second. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Anna just walked in. Uh, the, the, co- the, uh, the co-founder of Hybrid Fires. What I was going to add is uh, for, to, for the individual is to zero waste your plastic footprint. For example, go to your grocery list and say, "What can I? How can I get what I want without the legacy of plastic packaging? Can I get bread without the plastic bag? 
Can I get meats, you know, wrapped in paper? Can I go to a butcher and get, you know, better quality materials? You know, I get better quality foods. Can I buy in bulk? Can I go to a co-op where I can bring my own packaging? These things are getting easier and easier in our communities. Can you zero waste your, your school, for example? I don't know how many schools I've talked to where they've decided we're not going to give students a styrofoam tray every day for lunch or a plastic fork or, or a spoon. They're reinvesting in, in having a, a kitchen where they can make fresher foods and, and make better quality foods, not a legacy of trash. Uh, for example, here in Los Angeles, a few years ago, the school district decided to, to end styrofoam trays and go to a compostable tray. So you're seeing these zero waste practices happening at the home level, at the at schools, in businesses, bringing back the water cooler and not have a plastic bottles everywhere. We're seeing companies, uh, 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 all these industries and homes getting smarter at their, at their consumption and trying to build in uh, circularity. Yeah, I buy materials that they know are recyclable, or if not, then buy materials that they know are biodegradable. And this is part of a, a global zero waste movement. This is the upstream prevention that's happening. So part of the big prevention is to bring in the circular economy and zero waste in your city. And we're seeing like in Southeast Asia, for example, this is where it's ground zero is happening right now. There are organizations that are really getting good from village to village at sorting their, their, their waste. They, have, they either make it, they sort the biodegradables, they go door to door, sort biodegradables, they sort true market-driven recyclables, and what's left, the plastic diapers, the sachet packets, the straws, they ask themselves, their community, do we need this stuff? Mm -hmm. We provide this service in a better way that hasn't looked like this get trash. It's happening, and we're seeing, for example, in the Philippines, the Mother Earth Foundation, has put zero waste systems in 900 communities. And they awesome. Yeah, they reduced their waste from 100% going to landfill or to a dump or getting burned down to 22% of their landfilling. And that reducing little by little as they, they innovate better systems. So that's the future, is zero wasting our communities, getting us back to a circular economy. And it's happening village by village, home by home, Zero waste your grocery list, zero waste your school, your office, and that's going to that's gonna get the solution we want, that preventative solution we're after. So you'd say you feel optimistic? Much, much more than I was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, beginning this, you know, seeing trash on every beach, uh, seeing trash in every time I drag another cross the ocean service, the most remote parts of the planet. I was pessimistic, but now the activity that's happening worldwide and the focus of organizations. I mean, there's no one talking about cleaning up the ocean surface anymore. Everyone's saying, you got to turn off the tap. It's all prevention. There are thousands of organizations under the banner, break free from plastic, that are focused on prevention. And that's, it's, it's mimicking how we solve the whole in the ozone layer, how we solve smog over cities or tar on the ocean surface. Now we're saying zero waste in our communities, our home, our office, our school, our community, creating circular zero waste systems. It's working and it's scaling and it leaves me optimistic. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Marcus, I uh, thank you for your, your work and uh, everything you do to, to help drive this forward. I, and I appreciate your time today talking. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. My pleasure. I enjoy talking with you. Thank you so right. much. You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.